like to see three. But uh, that one I think we can live with. So I'll, we would rather have two, but if, if the administration still wants to keep it as three, I'm not going to push that one any further. Um, and then the last smaller item was dealing with items 10 and 11. It had to do with uh, boulevard trees. Um, and with this one, it just in the your in the report it says that we are to to pay for 62 boulevard trees, and that's for the 62 lots, which is typical in single family neighborhoods. However, with these being side by side four unit buildings, um, there isn't room for trees with the driveways there. Um, so I believe that will be another one that uh, administration will be changing, and it's just that we have to provide a a landscape plan that's approved at the time we submit our construction drawings and we're we're okay with that so the the main one uh, that we've had uh, lots of discussions on is related to the contribution and oversizing amounts outlined in number two um, so just a little bit of history on on this entire project um, we started this back in 2017 uh, when we hired SBC consultants out of Winnipeg to do um, our neighborhood plan because we had to make amendments to the Sent North Hill secondary plan. Um, at that time, it took about roughly a year and a half to two years to kind of get everything in place so that we could apply for the neighborhood plan amendment. As we were going through that process, if some of you may remember, there was um, the development cost charges were going through at that time as well. And um, there was um, contribute or there was capital projects. Clare Avenue was one of them. Uh, there was a bunch of land drainage um, infrastructure to go down the hill through the golf course. Uh, a lot of items that, as we were going through this process, um, a lot of that money was was switched over to kind of South Brandon, which seems to be growing a lot faster. Which we had those discussions during. the the process and um, kind of how that North Hill plan was going to develop changed immensely because everything was based on the land drainage going through the golf course. So basically phase one was the golf course developing, phase two was anything north of Clare Avenue and then you just kind of keep going up until you hit uh, the road in behind the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, at that time we had to provide a land drainage report basically had to redo the report that was done a few years earlier um, to show how we can develop the portion that we were looking to do um, without the main land drainage components going down to, to Braycrest and then to the Assiniboine River. So um, you know, we paid a lot of money to get that taken care of. Um, from that, a technical memo was attached to the, the North Hill secondary plan that outlined how our properties and the other owners kind of in the group could develop the property without that main trunk going to the river. Um, and that was implemented under figure 16 in that technical report. And there's paragraphs in there that talk about it that basically the North Hill, they weren't going to do a series of multiple ponds anymore. It was going to be one pond on the city property that's roughly, I guess, kind of to the center, center east of, uh, of the entire development. We're going to be required to dig the pond uh, based on what we would require for storage and do a ditch drainage from our development all the way to that pond. So our contribution would be doing all that work, submitting all the studies, all the construction plans in order to make development happen because we were told there would be no upgrades to any infrastructure on the North Hill for 15 to 20 years. Um, so under that, I mean, we've been working the last, um, that secondary plan and the technical memo was approved by council back in February of last year. Since that time, we've been approved for a Manitoba housing uh, initiative to develop seven affordable housing units in part of this development. And it's our understanding that this will be kind of a, a yearly um, thing happening that we can apply for more. So. Um, we were working with administration, Ryan Nickel, specifically on how can we kind of make this thing go. And we kind of worked on it from probably about March until
until March 2020, I'd say until middle of summer, August, to the point where we had enough room on boulevards to make sure we had enough snow storage. We were going down to every little detail, moving things six inches a foot here. So once that was kind of finalized in August, September of last year, we got our consultants starting to get the applications ready and the designs for this because we have to have these units, the seven that we got funding for, built and finished by March of 2022. So we've been kind of going back and forth. We've been meeting with the city a lot. We've met with engineering on, you know, just to make sure as part of all these technical memos that were done, you know, the previous year, we didn't have to store any water on our site. It was all the memos. We just wanted to be clear. So we had meetings with administration in September, I think again in maybe October, November. The plan was still as per this figure 16. And then roughly about a month before we went to the planning commission, we got, you know, a two or three page document saying that we had all these different options for storage, but it looks like we're going to have to put the pond on our property because they don't have the, they haven't done the technical information to figure out what the entire drainage system on the North Hill is going to be, which wasn't a surprise because it was pushed back to 20 years. And we did this technical memo in order to allow us to develop in the meantime. So since then, we've been going back and forth a little bit. And then, you know, roughly three weeks ago when the report was submitted to the planning commission, we got a list of conditions saying that we had to pay 300, I believe $14,000 as a contribution with no backup, no map. It was split up, I think, into materials, excavation. I mean, I think you have the breakdown. So I just got the breakdown on Thursday at the end of the day, and I got the map that it was based off of on Friday. And we're here today on Monday. So I don't have, I haven't had a chance to go through a lot of the stuff or get our technical people to look at it. But the main thing it looks like is we're paying for a pipe that I'm not sure who came up with it, but it's 25 or 2,400 millimeters, which is big. Like, I don't think there's a pipe that size in Brandon. So, I mean, we have a real big issue because I, like we expect development needs to pay for development. I have no problem with that. But to me, like the numbers that have been brought up here, I think it says April 9th is when it was created. And the first I saw it was maybe a week later. And then I just got the backup on Thursday. So there's been no plan done. No one's been hired to come up with an overall drainage plan for the North Hill of the city. So it's tough to pay into something when you don't know what the plan is and you don't know if it's ever going to come to fruition because this is 20 years out is what we're being told. But I mean, that's our big issue. So I'm not really sure how we resolve that, but that's kind of where it's at. So I put it through to administration that, you know, we're developing based on this plan that was put forward a year ago. And I understand things change, but that's what everything's been based off of. That's what our applications to Manitoba housing was based off of. And now at the last minute, it's just, no, we need you to pay this. So it's a tough one to swallow that late in the game when we've been working on this for roughly three years. So I'll leave it at that. But if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. This may inspire some questions because one hand, obviously council is always interested in seeing things move forward. We're in the season here. I'm sure you need to kind of get going. Yet on the other hand, we're going to be a predicament here in a few minutes when we get to that item on the agenda in terms of, you know, I really would like these things to be kind of worked out. But we'll open up the floor, first of all, for questions of Mr. McMillan on his presentation. 
Some of this is a little technical, so it'll be hard probably for counsel to digest sitting here, especially in this format. But I've got Counselor Chaboye first, so go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship, through the presenter. One question I have for you. You raised concerns about the size of the pipe that you've never seen in Brandon that they're mentioning in the cost here for this, for development costs. What is the usual size of pipe that you expect to see on this, in this program? Through Your Worship, Counselor Chaboye, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a civil engineer either, but just from what I've been told from, you know, the people who install pipe for our underground division, they said it's kind of like double of what they've seen elsewhere. So just for comparison, in our Bellafield development, I think the largest pipe we had in there was maybe a 1,200 millimeter pipe. So this is double the size of that. The problem is, it's just, it's not based on a study that was done. It was information that I'm assuming was done internally and put together kind of at the last minute. So if it was part of an overall study, we have no problem kind of, you know, paying the fair share because that's, that's how it works. But, well, thanks for that. I think we can elaborate and ask the question of, of our engineering or planning department once, once the motion comes forward. Thanks. You're welcome. And watch your further hands. While I am, I'm going to ask Mr. McMillan a question that will help us later. It is about timing. You know, we, we periodically get into these situations. We want to keep it moving forward. And on the other hand, we want to make it right. You want it to be right. Obviously you don't want the council imposing, you know, costs or requirements on there that are, you know, not suitable and vice versa. You know, we need the thing to work. We've certainly been reminded of, of, you know, inadequate, you know, drainage considerations and, you know, what the, what the outcome is, you know, kind of nowadays. So I just really wanted to ask you about timing, Steve, in terms of, you know, here we are tonight, if there's still a few little, you know, calculations, you know, more work has been done. I do understand that you and administration were meeting, you know, right up until the end of last week. And as you did indicate in your presentation, here we are Monday. So I think we're always mindful of not holding things up. You know, we're, we're May the 3rd. I think our next meeting is sharply in two weeks on, on May the 17th. But I did really need to understand your timing and not want to see us impose any delays. You know, on the other hand, is there a, is a period like, you know, would a two week delay still work with your project parameters? Sure. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, I mean, from our end, I think there was two options or possibly three. I mean, one was if you, I guess you could make whatever decision you want tonight and make the changes you want. But the other option is, you know, we could defer this decision until two weeks from now. And, you know, hopefully there's enough time in there that we meet with administration and we can work something like that out. Ultimately, we do have the option, I guess, to, you know, appeal any decision that would have another public hearing in front of council. I mean, I'd rather not do that because that'll kind of delay it even further. But I'm not sure, I guess, depending on what counselor administration says tonight, I'm not sure we'd be able to work out that number two, possibly. So I'd be willing to do that. The other items I think are going to be worked out tonight, but that big one, you know, if it's only two weeks to the next council meeting, that might be an option to try to work that out first. Seeing as the information just came on Thursday, so. Okay, thanks for that. I've got Councilor Fawcett. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Through your worship to Mr. McMillan. Thanks for bringing this forward. We can have this discussion with administration today, and I assume that they'll probably start discussions with you again tomorrow. 
the recommendation today is that third reading is going to be held in advance anyway mm. until some of this is agreed upon. So it does give us that opportunity to ask some of these questions that you've posed uh, and and that they, they'll work with you, the administration and yourself, to uh, bring that third reading back to us, uh, you know, with something that they uh, accept and that uh, you're closer to accepting as well. But for right now, um, we are probably only going to give it second reading with all these questions. Like, we, we weren't going to be passing a third reading tonight anyway, it doesn't look like. No. Uh, and I agree with you, the... Uh, uh, four or five and uh, 62 trees and that, I think we could probably deal with that tonight, but we're not going to be able to deal with at council that other issue you have. I think we'll have a direct administration to do, to do that. So, right. uh, but that, that's good. That is uh, good information for us to have in the discussion tonight. So thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Flossa. That was good uh, uh, to add that in. Other uh, questions of Mr. McMillan? Well, he is on screen. We will be hearing from administration, of course, uh, on this item in a little while here. I'm not seeing any further hands up. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. McMillan. Um, again, it's a complicated matter, but I'm sure we'll uh, get this sorted out and get you on your way uh, and get building shortly. So thank you very much. Stay tuned. Uh, a a uh, motion to uh, receive that presentation would be in order, please. Councillor Fossa. And seconded by Councillor Parker. So on the motion to receive, now I'm not sure if Councillor, okay, no, time went down. So uh, I think we're ready for the question on the motion to receive. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. Under the order of committee reports, Your Worship, we have a verbal report from the Age Friendly Committee. Very good. Uh, is that Councillor Chaboye tonight? It's, it's, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, uh, I thought, uh, thank you. I thought it would be important to give a progress report on what our committee's been up to. Uh, first, I'd like to, um, you know, we are delighted to welcome our new members to the committee, Marilyn Forsyth, Deirdre Chisholm, and Ryan Sturgeon. Uh, they're definitely going to be a, a, a much uh, needed, well, appreciated asset to the committee. Um, we're also embarking on a series of meetings with city uh, senior administration to familiarize all the departments with our mandate of an age-friendly committee of council and to look at opportunities together. So we've met with uh, uh, the acting city manager, the director of parks and recreation services. We've also met with the director of planning and transportation uh, department, and also um, Andrew Mock on the Southeast Brandon community plan. And we also have one coming up with public works on May 13th. So these are very fruitful discussions and you'll see more and more that uh, we're trying to um, get um, all the uh, administration and departments to see uh, our community through an age-friendly lens. Uh, in early January, we released a new resource. It's called uh, How to Guide Tips for Moving from Rural Living to City Living. This was developed with the Brandon Age-Friendly Committee in partnership with the Economic Development Brandon and the Brandon University Psych Nursing Program. The intent of this resource is to support older individuals in rural communities who may be thinking of relocating to Brandon. Uh, the resource has been distributed broadly through southwestern Manitoba and by Prairie Mountain Health uh, Seniors Resource Nurses. It is also available on our age-friendly website uh, as soon as it's uh, more operational. Uh, age-friendly Brandon has been very active on social media um, promoting our initiatives and those of our community partners. And we would strongly encourage mayor and council um, of all of you to uh, do a like on our Facebook page and check out what we're up to. That would be appreciated. Um, our committee has just finished uh, completing our new action plan for this year to address all the eight domains in, in our age-friendly community. And uh, we'll be bringing that uh, to you um, probably at a 
meeting coming up soon. Um, also, um, there'll be more information to follow on uh, the television series we're producing with Westman Media. Uh, we're hoping to have two shows under our belt uh, by the end of June, and then there will be another eight programs to follow throughout uh, the fall. So uh, I'll keep you posted uh, once we get something uh, on the camera. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, also, um, we did uh, receive some communication from Age Friendly Manitoba. They're a partner of ours, and they're asking, reaching out to the community uh, for uh, short stories on 500 words, and they like the story to start out um, with the line, we are more age-friendly because we, and you, uh, you can either be in uh, a city official or a member of the community, and they want to hear about uh, internet, intergenerational solidarity, inclusivity, partnerships, volunteering, everything that you would look at it from uh, making our city age friendly. So it, it sounds like an exciting collaboration and to visit, visit the age friendly Manitoba website if you want to participate in that uh, short story. And last, uh, we'd like to thank the city of Brandon uh, for the amazing design and implementation of a new crosswalk at 34th and Lakeview Drive. Uh, we've noticed the signage and the flashing lights are lower than your traditional pedestrian crosswalk design and makes it more visible for pedestrians and for vehicle traffic. These lights are also solar powered, so we think that's great for environmental uh, consideration and it's definitely been incorporated as an age-friendly initiative and uh, thank you for that. So, so that's our report from the Age-Friendly Committee. Very good, thank you very much. It's an excellent uh, report, uh, Councillor Chaboyer. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, I think that's a uh, Fabulous idea doing the the uh, um, resource for um, rural residents. Uh, I think people are quite familiar with the fact that Brandon, uh, you know, a significant industry for us, if you want to call it that, is uh, you know we are an attractive uh, place for both young people and for people to retire. So we we are yeah, kind of cr growing at uh, both ends of our demographic, and uh, you know I think. People in, especially Western Manitoba, are pretty comfortable with Brandon uh, because they've been, you know, coming here for various appointments for years, and then, you know, we're we're happy that they, you know, see fit to may want to settle here in their retirement. So I think it's a great idea that you've developed this resource to help kind of round out that experience for them. So mm -hmm. we'll open up the floor now for any questions that there may be of uh, Councillor Chaboye uh, on the Age Friendly Report. Not seeing any questions, but again, it was a very thorough report, so uh, I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, so that was the only report that we formally were expecting, but sometime there were other uh, committees that may have uh, occurred uh, that we weren't uh, aware of, and we would take those reports now. I'm not seeing any, so a motion to accept the age-friendly report uh, would be uh, in order, please. I'll move that, Your Worship. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Shaboye, seconded by Councillor Cameron. Any discussion? Seeing none, we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. And next item, please. The order of inquiries, Your Worship. Inquiries. We've got uh, Councillor Chaboye, so uh, go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I look like a real keener tonight here. I got the inquiries and reports. Okay, my first uh, query is um, Can the City of Brandon seek clarification from our partner, the Keystone Center, on what the rules are for citizens accessing the green space? In the past, the public have always viewed this urban forest as an open public space and have enjoyed walking around the grounds, um, had their little picnics and visits under the trees in the urban forest there. And that urban forest is extremely valuable to, to our community. Um, is this allowed or have the access rules been changed outside of the usual COVID protocols? I wasn't sure if I would ask the administration this question or the members of council that are on the Keystone board, uh, how it works. 
Very good. Well, as we routinely do, I'm going to call upon uh, City Manager Ron Bowles, who does have a response ready for us. Well, I have a response thanks to Perry LaRock, Director of Parks and Recreation Services. And uh, Councillor Shaboy, you're, you're absolutely right that the uh, public can um, enjoy the, the urban forest as, as they always have. Um, what Mr. LaRock says, we have spoken to the Keystone Centre regarding this inquiry. The Keystone Centre grounds are open for public use. All persons must, of course, follow Manitoba COVID health, uh, COVID-19 protocols when outside specifically. All persons are prohibited from assembling in gatherings of more than 10 persons at an outdoor public space. And he also threw in, as a reminder to the public, that uh, if they're outside using the grounds or walking around with their dogs, they should please pick up their garbage and clean up after their pets. Now, of course, your original question was on whether the urban forest was open to the public, and absolutely it is. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, I know that there was concerns raised because there was some fencing put up around, and we were quite excited to see a new, um, I think there's a new stage coming up and where there's going to be a tent structure, and, and um, it just kind of raised some flags for people if, if you know, if it was going to be accessible because it is a beautiful spot. Thank you. Uh, do you want my next query now? Sure, please do. Okay. Uh, citizens in the Green Acres Ward are asking if extra pumps and their operators are lined up for Plan B this year and the chance that there may be high groundwater rain events as there have been in the past. I know that we are um, looking at probably a drought year, but at the same time it looks like these little flash floods can hit us regardless. So. Uh, I would like. Uh, it would be nice to know what the plan is for uh, if we do get hit with those, which we have the last few years. So. Very much. Again, back to Mr. Bowles, who does have a response for us. Thanks for the question again, Councillor Chevoyer. Yes, planning to uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. So uh, we are planning. And Pam Richardson, your director of public works, provided this response to your question. She said. To date, all city-owned pumps have been inspected and checked for operations earlier this spring. The Underground Utilities Department has 12 of, the, uh, of, of, the, of various sizes and flow capacity on site and ready to be deployed should they be needed. The city also has the ability to bring in extra pumps uh, from external sources through an equipment rental process if that need arises. And then she went on to say that, um, you know, in addition, uh, We've hired seasonal staff um, for the department and they'll begin working this week. And those staff will be solely designated to working through drainage maintenance and drainage improvement tasks in the hopes of mitigating overland flooding and drainage issues around across the city. So yeah. uh, some preventative Thanks. work as well. Yeah, that sounds very good, very proactive in, in what we're looking at. Uh, the only other question I have for you on that, at some point it'd be nice if um, the public could have a phone number when if emergency does arise or when you start doing public announcements, if you see the weather is going to take a turn or something um, where citizens can phone, um, you know, because that's where they're going to be looking for a phone number if they need something pumped out or dealt with. And we do have our, our usual, uh, you know, City Works after hours line. I don't know the number right offhand, but uh, we, we should make sure that that's well uh, publicized and, and put out there and to uh, Mr. Bull's you know last um, you know paragraph in the, in the response uh, provided by Pam Richardson Council will recall that we had uh, dealt uh, significantly with the uh, topic of drainage at budget time and Council did make uh, significant investments in uh, both on the capital side of drainage which is kind of handled by development services and engineering but then on the operations side which is in the operations department which was referred to and uh, they are staffed up i know the topic did come up in earnest at uh, councillor barry's recent uh, ward meeting and uh, you know it was touched on and, and of course residents of uh, many wards are, are extremely interested in this uh, topic and you know council has uh, made uh, significant added investments uh, this year to be able to hopefully keep up with the operations side of uh, keeping the drainage uh, facilities maintained and properly flowing and uh, so we uh, hopefully that's going to work much better this year. 
So thanks for that question, Councilor Shaboye. Thank you, Worship, and thank you, Mr. Bowles. Okay, uh, those were uh, inquiries we were aware of in advance. Sometimes something crops up uh, late in the day on Monday. If there were any like that, we could uh, take them now. Okay, not seeing any other. Uh, it's kind of like the substitute teacher. We want to be easy on them the first. Uh, so we're going to be easy on the new city manager the first uh, first night out. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bowles. Uh, next item, please, uh, Madam Clerk. We have announcements, Your Worship. Councillor Parker. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just uh, would like, I don't know if this is an announcement, but I'm, I'm hoping that Councillors uh, Tejarle and Chaboy would uh, back me up in this one and encouraging everyone in our particular boards to get out and get vaccinated as soon as possible with uh, the inclusion of Green Acres and East End. The eligibility list the last couple of days uh, be extremely important and, and good for our, uh, for our respective neighborhoods in the city and ours. So we can get onward and upward with a, a decent summer in the end. So just encourage everybody to get out. That process in Brandon, in particular, is extremely, extremely well run and uh, it's it's seamless. So it's uh, kudos to them and just uh, encourage everybody to get out. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess what. Uh, Councillor Parker is referring to the province Manitoba have identified some uh, areas of uh, communities that uh, are eligible just from a, a community risk standpoint and uh, uh, the, the what they classified as downtown which uh, of course uh, Prairie Mountain Health region is fairly sizable goes from Pacific Avenue to Richmond Avenue from 1st to 18th Street is one designation and then the other one is East End uh, and, which I presume is everything uh, roughly east of 1st Street uh, I would uh, imagine uh, are now eligible for anybody over the age of 18 to be vaccinated so uh, thanks for bringing that up uh, Councillor Parker and I would have to uh, concur with your, your comment uh, at the occasion uh, my number came up and I was vaccinated uh, uh, last Thursday at the Keystone Super Site, and in my view, it uh, couldn't be smoother. It was, I believe, in excess of a thousand people were vaccinated that day, and so that's a lot of logistics. The people there are, are doing a fabulous job, so people should really be encouraged to, as soon as you're eligible for whatever vaccine you're eligible for, to uh, uh, sign up, and uh, it's uh, very well done. And uh, Councillor Cameron. Thank you, Worship. I will I will concur on the vaccination front as well. I know uh, 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 I was able to be vaccinated last week through a, a local doctor's office as well through the uh, change of age eligibility. Eligibility, so it was uh, very well run. So um, my announcement this evening is a discussion I had with a, a gentleman named Mark Saylor. Um, folks may know Mark's uh, partner in crime a little better as Grizzly. Um, Grizzly is a 150-pound licensed therapy dog who uh, volunteers at local hospitals and care homes and facilities in Manito in Minnedosa, Brandon, and Nipua. Um, Grizzly and his owner, Mark Saylor, have volunteered time each week over the past six years, but have temporarily had to stop their visits due to COVID-19. Um, as a way of for Grizzly to continue to give back, Stuff St. Bernard puppies are being donated to children in local hospitals until Grizzly is able to get back to in-person visits. Um, very happy to say that Heritage Co-op has come on board with this to partner with Grizzly and Mark on the initiative, and they'll be donate, donating one stuffed puppy for every stuffed puppy that was purchased between May 3rd and May 14th of this year. Um, and try and say stuffed puppy fast, but... Uh, <laughs> For more information on this, uh, folks can keep up to date on Grizzly's happenings by going to uh, various social media channels at Grizzly the Saint, all one word, Grizzly the Saint. So um, just nice to see a local organization come on board um, to help spread a little cheer during a challenging time for folks. And, and hopefully the pandemic wanes soon and Grizzly can get back to doing uh, what, uh, what that St. Bernard does best. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cameron. Uh, uh, Grizzly and Mark are rock stars in our region for sure, and uh, 
uh, glad that you've given them some uh, profiles so people can get on board. Uh, I've got Councillor Dejarly now, I think. Thank you, Chair, Your Worship. Am I uh, off mute? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to um, draw attention to uh, Wednesday, May 5th, being the, the National Day uh, to uh, for awareness of missing and murdered Indigenous women and, and two spirit um, individuals and uh, women and girls. Um, you might see a red dress pop up at a church or in somebody's um, window or in their car, or they might be wearing this on Wednesday. And so I, I hope everybody takes some time to uh, to think about um, the this, this situation. Uh, currently in Saskatchewan, there are there are nine um, young women and, uh, and, and girls that are cur currently actively missing right now. And um, you know, if you if you're not a male or if you're a female, you consider wearing a dress. Um, you could also uh, hang something um, from your window or in, in your front just to you know, show some solidarity there and to recognize that uh, this is still an ongoing problem that needs to uh, needs our attention. Thank you very much for that, uh, Councillor uh, Dejarle. Again, another uh, uh, situation that we need to provide some profile to, so thanks for doing so. Are there any other announcements? I do have one, but I'm just make sure Council of Cutting their time in. Councillor Fawcett, go ahead. Yes, thanks for your worship. Uh, I don't know much about this, so I'm going to guess uh, uh, Heather Owasik, uh, city clerk, to make an announcement on uh, the election on Wednesday, uh, if she has that information. I, I don't have it at the top of my hands. So I don't know where all the locations are, but we do have our uh, by-election uh, city council coming up. And that is correct, and that's the uh, uh, one that I was referring to that I was uh, going to make, so I was glad that uh, we get it out there. So uh, you're correct, Councillor Fawcett, that the Meadows Waverly Ward uh, is having a by-election this Wednesday, May the 5th, and I'm going to call upon the city clerk just to remind us of the uh, specific details in terms of the hours and the voting places so, uh, so that we can encourage people to get out and vote who reside in that ward. So thanks, Councillor Fawcett. So go ahead, uh, Ms. Iwasik. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, Wednesday is by-election day for Meadows Waverly residents or landowners. Uh, a couple of things regarding eligibility. You have to have lived in the ward or owned property for at least six months prior to election day, which would be November 5th of 2020 and you will require identification when you come to the polling locations. We have three uh, voting places available. The first is Richmond Park Church at 1525 26th Street, First Baptist Church at 3881 Park Avenue, and we have a drive through location at the southeast parking lot of the Keystone Center at 1175 18th Street. All three of these polling locations will be open from 8 a.m to 8 p.m. again on Wednesday, May 5th, and eligible voters can choose which voting place they want to vote at. And again, of course, you have to be 18 years of age and a Canadian citizen as well as a resident or landowner in the ward. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. So again, uh, these elections are very important uh, and uh, there's two uh, individuals running for the position, so get your hands on some information about them. They've been in the paper a couple of times. Uh, there was a uh, bit of a forum last week, uh, and uh, now the, the last stage is for people of that uh, ward to get out and vote. So thank you very much. Okay, before we move on, I just want to make sure we don't have any other announcements uh, missed. Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, we can move on to the next item of business, Madam Clerk. Under general business, Your Worship, we have a request for additional funding for the Flood Protection Program. Okay, again, we would have uh, staff available. Uh, I think Council is quite familiar with this uh, uh, program. Uh, it's been a very popular program, so uh, a motion would be in order. Councillor Barry, go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have no video on my uh, feed tonight, so you're just going to hear audio from me on that. But I would like to move that an additional 200000 be allocated to the 2021 Flood Protection Subsidy Program.
for the installation of sump pumps and back water valves, and further that the said funds be expended from the water distribution reserve. Thank you. I'm a seconder, please. Councillor Chaboyer, who wish to speak? Uh, actually, I'm going to ask if Patrick Kulak can kind of jump in on this, as this was a recommendation that was actually brought forth by the administration in that department. But I just want to add in that this program has been exceeded expectations of, of uh, response we've got from residents, and uh, there's still the need out there to get some of these uh, residents looked after with the problems we've had with, with water issues and overland flooding. So um, I'm going to ask Patrick to jump in, and I'm asking all of Council to please... Uh, Listen and, and support this once more this year. Very much, uh, Mr. Kulak, I think is on the line here, so go ahead if you are. Okay. Well, Your Worship and Council, this is not Patrick, this is uh, Ryan, but um, this report came through my department, so I'll speak to it quickly. And then if you still want Patrick, I'm sure he can jump right on. As uh, Councilor Barry talked about, this isn't a new item, but uh, came up recently where we had uh, brought forward a request for an additional $100,000. There was 100000 set aside by Council originally, and uh, we nearly uh, provided almost that full amount to residents as part of the program. It's been very successful. Uh, it has been slowing down a little bit recently, which is, is not terrible news because there's other things <laughs> we have to be doing as well other than administering this program, but uh, we are still getting steady applications coming through the door. Um, so we're hoping that uh, making a request to council for another 200,000 will, will do the trick and take us to uh, the end of the year. And I'm sure we'll reevaluate this program in future years as we try to make the the residents in our homes a little bit more resilient um, from flooding. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Nickel uh, while we have him at the floor? And we've talked about this one a few times, so I think most people, the Councillor Cameron, though, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Nickel. Just uh, wondering if you could um, just remind residents who are who are online or watching what kind of the parameters of the program, what sort of cost sharing the city does uh, with the program, um, be it backwater valve or be it sump pump installation. Yeah, through uh, council to Councillor uh, Cameron. Uh, so the program provides a reimbursement uh, to homeowners for backwater valves and uh, sump pumps. Um, so you could do both or you could do one or the other. We typically encourage our residents to do both up to a maximum of 75 percent and there's a there's a value attached to that as well but uh, typically those values don't exceed 75 percent so the homeowner's in for 25 percent the city provides 75 percent and uh, of course you got to come up come over and get permits through our office that's kind of what we do uh, but our inspectors have been going out there prior to people deciding what they're doing just giving them advice so i think the piece is if you're interested is make sure you get a hold of our office uh, We'll be happy to reach out and have someone visit your property and provide you some guidance on uh, what's the best approach for you and your property. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Nickel? Not seeing any others. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we're back to the main motion. Any further discussion before we call the question? See that? Let's ready for the question then all those in favor opposed and is carried thank you very much next item please you're muted there heather my mute button here. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, I apologize. Your Worship, the next item is the applications to the Municipal Service Delivery Improvement Program. 
Very good. I'm uh, not sure if we we're having uh, any presentation from uh, administration first or just going straight to the motion. A motion would be in order, please. Councilor Fawcett, go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, through your worship. <laughs> That the following application for the province of Manitoba Municipal Service Delivery Improvement Program be supported by the Council of the City of Brandon, Fleet Service Operational Audit, an Access Transit System Review, and a Cleaning Service Review. And a seconder, please. Councillor Parker, wish to speak or to link us to? Uh, if there is administration, but this is a, uh, the, the province sort of a. Uh, offers up here to do this it provides the opportunity to do this it doesn't have big big impact if any hardly on our budget um so we just have to go through this process and uh and they'll uh they'll help us do the fleet service operation audit access to transit service review and clean cleaning service review so i don't know if there's a whole lot more to it but if uh, management does have something give it to us yeah, I think this came out of uh, Mr. Hammond's area, so I'm not sure if Dean you had anything you wanted to add to this. Ed? Thank you, Your Worship. Just to expand on what uh, Councillor Fawcett noted about the program. So this is a provincial uh, program. The province has allocated $5 million to min municipalities who wish to apply for this program. And at the end of the day, the objective is to, uh, the province aims to, to help municipalities find uh, either uh, improved service delivery options, uh, increased uh, efficiencies, or reduced costs. And if we are successful in our, any or all of our three applications, then the uh, province will essentially supply us with a consultant to uh, perform a review of these operations. Uh, we would, of course, work with the, uh, the consultant to do that review, but there's no cost to the municipality or minimal cost at that. And at the end of the day, the consultant will provide us with a, uh, a report on each of these projects with a series of recommendations. Uh, the report must be made public. So this would not be done in secrecy. It would be very transparent and above board. Whatever recommendations come from the consultant for these projects would be posted public publicly. And then at the end of the day, um, the municipality has the option of um, uh, implementing um, the recommendations as it sees fit. There is no obligation to undertake uh, any or all of the recommendations, but um, we thought it'd be beneficial to apply for this program. Uh, these are projects that we've wanted to uh, tackle for a long time now, and if we can get some, uh, some cost support to help out with these projects, then that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. I think I've got Councillor Desjardins with a question, perhaps. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, through your worship. Uh, question for uh, Mr. Hammond. You're, it sounds like you're saying this was, it's only really for like one off projects that we're looking at. It's, it's a, but it sounds, but it sounds like it's a municipal service delivery program. So I'm just curious what was potentially on the table that we could have had covered that. And, and what wasn't like why we decided to go with these three for, is my first question and then why we wouldn't uh, if possible look at something like public transit or police services or the whole audit of the city because it's something we talked about at uh, budget so i'm just hoping you can provide some clarification uh for sure so these were the three uh, projects that kind of boiled to the top from administration's point of view uh, there is a cap on the amount of uh, funds that would be allocated to any one project. So uh, a couple of the ones you mentioned would be very big projects and they'd be over and above that that cap. Um, I was on a conference call with the project with um, pretty much every other municipality in Manitoba who also thinks this program is a good deal. So I suspect there's going to be very... Uh, large uptake, and um, at the end of the day, we're, we're hoping to have these three projects uh, approved, but there is going to be uh, a lot of competition with other municipalities. So at the end of the day, if we have these, what I would call uh, smaller to mid-sized projects uh, approved, then I think that would be a huge win for us. 
Okay, I mean, I'd, I'm likely going to go uh, approve the, uh, the this team. Sorry, my teams went funny there. I guess I'm just wondering, you know, if there were even a cost-sharing opportunity if we were going to do something larger, right? We could go for a certain chunk of money. You bring that back to council. Council says, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take half of that because we wanted to review this. And I just thinking about fleet, I thought we had done a pretty large overview of fleet in the last few years so i was surprised to see that on there but if you think that we can find more cost savings uh through this review then i'm in favor so i'll leave it at that thanks thanks councillor charlie i don't see any other hands up um thank you mr hammond for that uh elaboration so if there's not any further discussion i think we're ready for the question all for the question then, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Next item, please. The Code of Conduct for Citizen Appointees to Council Boards, Commissions and Committees. And this is in response to Councillor Lukey's notice of motion given at the April 6th meeting. Did you want to make that, Councillor Lukey? Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the Code of Ethical Conduct for Boards, Commissions, and Committees be adopted, whereby execution of same shall be required upon commencement of any term of office by all citizen members appointed to boards, commissions, and committees established by the Council of the City of Brandon. Thank you. Seconder, please. Officer Cameron. Who wishes to speak? I will just briefly, uh, Your Worship, uh, as uh, Ms. Wozniak uh, noted, I did give uh, notice of motion at our April 6th meeting uh, to introduce this code of conduct. It is, uh, should be noted that this would apply to the Planning Commission, uh, Board of Revision, the Poverty Committee, the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee, the Age Friendly Committee, and the Brandon Urban Aboriginal Peoples Council. Um, City of Brandon recognizes uh, public confidence and public trust are essential to good governance and is committed to fostering and maintaining the highest standards of professionalism and ethical conduct. Of course, we as the uh, uh, City Council do have a code of conduct that we follow. There is an employee code of ethics and code of ethical conduct required by members of the Brandon Police Board. And really, these other uh, committees, boards, and commissions that are... Um, established by the Council of the City of Brandon are by extension uh, representing Council as well uh, and just think it's a good idea to have similar uh, ethical conduct standards established for our citizen members that uh, sit on those boards and committees as well. Thank you for that, Councillor Lupe. Um, any other discussion on this um, motion? And Councillor Chaboye and Councillor Dejarly. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This uh, question is for uh, Councillor Lukey. Um, if this uh, code of conduct policy passes or changes to include all committees, uh, would all the existing members have to be educated or do they sign something saying that they've read it? How is it going to work in, in practice, Bruce? Certainly would be sent to, uh, sorry, Your Worship, through Your Worship, to Councillor Chaboye. Certainly the, uh, the Code of Ethical Conduct would be uh, sent to the committee members and they would have to sign and return to the clerk's office uh, to establish the fact that they've read and understand the Code of Ethical Conduct. Okay, thank you. And uh, did you have your hand up, Councillor Dejarle? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, through your workshop to, uh, to Councillor Lupke, uh, thanks for, for bringing this up, Bruce. I think it's a good idea. I just had a, a couple of quick questions. Um, if the, the line two, and I, I just have to pull it up. Sorry, everything's on my computer, and so I'm going to lose you guys for a second. Forgive me, but it was line two. It was talking about training, uh, Bruce. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate. It said that language was a bit vague. It was talking about maybe provided 
or required. And I'm just wondering if we could clean up that language a bit so that it was like any training that you know is required rather than may be provided because it sounded like that was unclear. I would be amenable with that for sure. I uh, I think there might be a um, uh, opportunity that uh, uh, there could be a uh, um, you know a, a virtual session provided to the committee members at their convenience or even recorded in our new format to to have them watch that. But I. I think it's probably up to uh, the individual committees to establish uh, whether they feel that's a required component or whether that's something that's just recommended. Yeah, so I, I guess that's like I like I like what you've got on paper there, and I'm just wondering about even re removing that piece if we're not going to because they're all volunteer um, folks, you know, put their time and we have we you know I, I would. We, we, we had to do our training and that's fair. We are you know, uh, municipal officials. Uh, we could offer this, it's suggested. And certainly there might be some, some councils that would go ahead and, and certainly some members of those committees that would go ahead and do it. But I don't know if we need to mandate it at this point. Certainly reading your code of conduct there might be sufficient. Uh, just a suggestion. Uh, everything else I think looks great. So if you wish, Councillor DeJarley, uh are you wishing to remove the required portion? Is that what you're? I mean, I, I'm curious to hear what others think, but I think we could, that it serves its purpose without that line of where we would require them to go through that same training that we, we did or anything like that. Recommend. I just to inter interject. I, I read that like, there's many things in here that uh, relate to this is really just the expectations of uh, being a committee member not necessarily related to taking further training of a code of conduct such as the one that we just took and I'll expand on that in a minute like this one just read to me that members shall undergo undergo any training that may be provided or required for them to enhance their capabilities as board members so I read that to me that if the age friendly committee wanted to lay on a one hour seminar on board governance or on um you know any, you know on any any number of things that they were providing then the expectation is that you would take the training that was provided it wasn't necessarily about code of conduct matters uh, the way i was reading it i'm not sure yeah. whether Councillor Lukey or Ms. Iwazek had something to add through your worship that's sort of how i read it too and, and even so even if we did want to keep it in there if just the language could be a little clear around the obligation for training just so there's you know it's still a little unclear to me i follow you um any suggestions i think uh, your worship uh I believe if we wanted to amend and remove the two words of or required, I think would suffice. Under item two. Yeah, I think, sorry through your worship, I think that works, Bruce. Okay, um, somebody want to make that amendment, please? Uh, credit for that, Councillor DeJarley, as well, you made that amendment. Moving, removing the words. Uh, or required from clause number two. Is that correct? I'll second it. Seconded by Councillor Shaboye. Any discussion on the amendment? Fairly straightforward. It does clean it up. Ready for the question on the amendment then? All those in favor? Opposed? And it's carried. Back to the main motion. Uh, and we could certainly take any other discussion on any other uh, matter if there are some. Councillor Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just in reviewing this as well prior to the meeting, I just had one question with regards to the Brandon Downtown Development Group, whether they um, fell in in that same window as far as these groups or, or whether they would sort of... Um, would they fall under the bylaws as well? 
because I note that they're not in the list of groups available there. And I think uh, one of the Councillor Lukey or Ms. Iwasik uh, does have some background on that because I did ask the same question. So. Your Worship, I can respond if you wish. Yes, please. So a part of determining whether we had authority to impose such a uh, code of conduct or ethical conduct was whether it was a, create, a board created strictly by council. So both the, the BDDC, the Brandon General Museum, for example, the Riverbank uh, Discovery Center, the Westman Auditorium, the Keystone Center, all have representatives of council on those boards, but we did not create those boards uh, from a, a council perspective. They're not a council committee or board. So at this point, while we could certainly suggest uh, that it be something those boards look at as part of their governance, we can't impose it on them. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Sawasiak, and, and thanks, Your Worship, for that. I just wanted some clarification because uh, like another, like other members of council, we do sit on those boards as well. So it's good to have that information when we do go back to the, our respective boards to, to share that. So thank you. Any other questions or discussion? We'll just uh, expand on a, on a uh, comment that Councillor Desjardins uh, made and uh, you know, for the benefit of the public to uh, uh, highlight the fact that uh, it became uh, law uh, in the province of Manitoba that all elected officials uh, must take a code of conduct training course and had to do so by uh, May the 1st. And uh, so that covered every elected municipal official in the uh, province. I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, uh, every single Brandon elected official uh, has uh, successfully uh, completed that course. So again, it's uh, good that this uh, area, you know, is certainly a, an area that has burgeoned over the years and uh, uh, now it does have some teeth in it. And uh, it was an online course provided by a development provided by the province of Manitoba that we could all uh, uh, take advantage of. Uh, I thought it was fairly well done and uh, relatively uh, easy uh, to do and uh, commend all councillors for uh, having uh, completed that in the uh, time required. So I just want to add that in. Without any further discussion, I think we're ready. Did the mover wish to close, Councillor uh, Lupe? Uh, just briefly, Your Worship, I appreciate uh, council support for uh, uh, helping put this motion on the table and certainly I uh, hope that you'll support it. And I would also just uh, comment a bit on Councillor Cameron's uh, question. I think this uh, document and the 14 points that are enclosed in it can serve as a bit of a template for any of those other boards that we do have council members that sit on uh, that wish to adopt a uh, code of ethical conduct themselves. So it certainly can be a template for that. Well put. Okay, I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Say it, please. Is the request for a leave of absence for Councillor Ron Brown? Would somebody like to make that motion, uh, please? Councillor Fawcett, go ahead. There. In honor of Ronnie, I didn't put my uh, my mute on. <laughs> so in. Uh, that an unpaid leave of absence until further notice by Councillor Ron Brown from his duties as Councillor for the City Council be approved. Secretary, please. Councillor Barry. Sorry, thank you. Uh, mover wish to speak? Yeah, thank you, through Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Brown is just having a little bit of a health trouble here right now and, uh, and, and probably is not going to be able to, to commit to his duties for the next little while or the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, we do have um, a bylaw that does have attendance required, but we also have it in our bylaws that we can uh, give extended leave. So I think uh, Councillor Brown is gonna do his best to get himself feeling 100% again, and uh, we'll sort of assess things as, uh, as we move forward. 
Thank you. Uh, well said. Uh, we met with Councillor Brown and this would certainly uh, help him uh, through this period of time. Um, as always, uh, we've got a very uh, teamwork uh, approach and other councillors, so maybe the ones that are nearest his ward, uh, uh, can pick up some of the calls. Uh, if uh, residents of uh, uh, Councillor Brown's ward, you know, do have issues. Uh, certainly, they can call uh, City Hall, uh, either to the City Manager's office or the Mayor's office, and we'll, you know, make sure that those um, matters are dealt with. Um, Councillor Brown does sit on some uh, committees. We'll be following up uh, next um, uh, council meeting with uh, some backfilling of uh, committees. Similarly, Councillor. Uh, Loreggio had been sitting on some committees as well, and we were awaiting by-election to take care of that. So this Wednesday, of course, that will occur. So uh, the uh, uh, individual that uh, uh, is victorious in that by-election will be included in the uh, committee structure. So uh, we expect to have that to council for uh, next meeting to cover off these committees uh, as well. Uh, some on a permanent basis, others perhaps on a temporary basis, Councillor uh, Brown's uh, case. And uh, you know, Councillor Barry's hands up, it might have been from seconding the motion, but I wasn't sure if he had something to add. No, just took a hand up. Okay, any, uh, any uh, further discussion about this motion? Uh, Councillor Shaboye? Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I just want to reach out to Councillor Brown and hope that you're going to get better soon. And uh, as I told you on an email, uh, Councillor Brown, that I, I'm uh, definitely willing to help you out with any uh, of your Richmond ward issues and your citizens in the ward uh, because um, his uh, ward does uh, have a boundary with mine and a lot of our issues are similar. So I'm, I'm more than uh, willing to help out on any uh, of the ward issues. Appreciate that, Councillor Shaboy. And again, a lot of people do end up uh, calling councillors that they know, and uh, you know, it kind of spreads it around. So I'm sure that won't be an issue. We've got a very hardworking bunch of people on this council, so we're quite fortunate that way. So there are not further discussion. I think we're probably ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. And as was mentioned, we sure wish Councillor uh, Brown well as he uh, just focuses on his uh, health uh, at the moment. So that's good. And next item, please. Also under unfit or general business, you worship the tender for the 2021 contract B1 Underground Works. That is before us. A motion would be in order, please. Boss, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, through your worship. Uh, that the low bid submitted by Allen and Bolak Excavating Limited to carry out 2021 contract B1 underground works as per tender and specifications at a cost of $489,472.26 net of GST be accepted. And further, that $270,000 be authorized to be expended from the water distribution reserve for the Victoria Avenue water main valve replacement project. And can I get a seconder, please? Councillor Lukey. Now we do have administration available. Uh, Mr. Allard is available. He's the presenter on this. Uh, did you have some highlights you wanted to uh, present, uh, Mr. Allard? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, as put forward by uh, Councillor Fawcett. Um, part of the uh, planned works for this summer uh, under our Contract B-1 uh, underground works uh, included works at the Hilton lift station, the water reclamation facility, and the Kirkcaldy lift station. Um, uh, also planned was the replacement of the water main valve uh, an oversight uh, was uh, made in the in the financial plan. Um, so uh, engineering is asking for a supplemental uh, $270,000 uh, 
to replace the water main. Uh, it's currently uh, inoperable and, and stuck in a closed position, uh, unfortunately, and, and the replacement is required to ensure uh, reliable flow and pressure in the uh, in the residence and, and business area. Um, so, um, as I as I said, the two hundred seventy thousand dollars that is required uh, is available uh, in the uh, in the reserve um, for the uh, for the water, um, and uh, so we we do recommend that. Uh, um, these funds are allotted for, for the replacement. Thank you for that explanation. Is there any uh, questions of uh, Mr. Allard? Fawcett, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through your worship and thank you to Mr. Allard. Uh, two, two questions. Uh, one is uh, the installation of the knife gate valve at Kirkcaldy lift station, is that something that we, we, we should have should have had in with the original installation of that lift station, or is it uh, is it a, a, a was it an overlook or an after the fact? I'm not end up sliding in there. I'll uh, uh, Patrick uh, through your worship to Councillor Fawcett. Um, it was an oversight of the contract uh, for the lift station that was missed. And because of the timelines with funding, um, we had to proceed with completing that project prior to the installation of that valve. And so that uh, we planned it for this year and that's what you have in front of you. So it's really just, again, as I've said already, it's just something that was I mean, an oversight from that uh, lift station contract and something we'll correct this year. Okay, oh, that's excellent. And then uh, my follow-up question is, uh, you know, obviously you're comfortable with the bid because you've brought it forward to us, uh, but then there was four bidders, which is always great. Uh, it, it looked like we had a couple of competitive bids and a couple of not as competitive bids, but uh, we do have full confidence uh, in the bid price, just, just going off the four of them. Um, you know, it, it looked like two competitive bids. I'm comfortable with myself, I guess, but uh, just just want to get 100% assurance. I know you've brought it forward to us, so I'm sure you are. But yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, we've looked at some of the bids, comparing uh, with our engineering's estimate, and and uh, uh, we're uh, we're quite confident that uh, the bid uh, represents good value, um, and uh, and with the competitive process, uh, we recommend that we uh, we stick with the existing bid. Yeah, good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. And I've come to Cameron. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to uh, Mr. Allard. Just with regards to the add-on there and that replacement of the water main valve at the intersection of 25th and Victoria Avenue. Um, just wondering with regards to that, what the sort of construction timeline would be on something like that? Because I would imagine that it would impact uh, businesses and residents as far as water pressure or as far as um, access to water what kind of turnaround would a project like that take is it is it hours is it days is is it week like just wondering the impact to residents and businesses especially to the north of that yeah i, I would think that uh, uh very locally there that uh, we're probably in the neighborhood uh of approximately a week uh somewhere in that uh, but it should be a very very localized um, with the redundancies that are in the system, it, it should be quite localized to, to the issues that are recognized. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. And the fact that the valve in question is currently in the closed position and people are obviously getting water, so they must be getting water from, this. usually we have a, a loop that, uh, as you call it, the redundancy, so hopefully that people won't notice uh, too much impact and we should hopefully have an improved impact once we can open a valve again. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I didn't see any other hands up. Thank you very much, Mr. Allard. Um, coming back to the main motion then, any further discussion? Yeah, I think we're ready for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. 
Next item, please. Under the order of bylaws, Your Worship, bylaw number 7269, which is to rezone the property at 1501 Moreland Avenue from development reserve zone to residential moderate density parks and recreation and open space zones. And I would note there is an amendment required prior to second reading. Very good. Uh, so this is a fairly lengthy and uh, complicated one that we did have uh, um, presentation on earlier. So I probably would ask administration to come forward to um, to council first, and then we can start uh, sorting through the uh, the bylaw if that's in order. It looks like Mr. Nickel was prepared for that. So go ahead. Your Worship, through the council, I'll share my screen here. To jump to the the fun parts, uh, we're not going to present it all again here. But uh, the property we're talking about is to the north of uh, the future Clare Avenue here. So Monterey Estates is to the south, and 18th Street is to the to the west. Zooms in a little bit closer. That shows the property. Uh, Council previously approved the first uh, stages of development, which was the Wallal Home Park further to the east. That's the yellow area on the map here. And this is the next stage, which is for row housing on a public road. Um, it's a new type of development in, as it's typically seen on a private road. Uh, this map, uh, and I just cut it out here, shows the drainage catchment areas planned for in the secondary plan. So these larger catchment areas, and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, maybe not, but zone B is its own area. And when we're talking about the pond here and oversizing, we're talking about putting the pond in, which includes, of course, uh, which is storing the water, and then it includes all the discussion around pipes and ditches to convey it to the pond. So when we're talking about cost, that's what we're talking about, is the pond, which includes land value, excavation cost, design cost, and then the conveyance system, which in this case is by far the largest cost, which is piping to get to this pond. This map here shows the very rough calculations of areas included. Um, and when the presenter brought forward that we hadn't done a lot of infrastructure planning in this regard, they're probably correct. Um, that's why when this originally request originally came through circulation, uh, the recommendation of administration was to have it stored on site. And that was because of uh, council's priorities of servicing growth in the city and our focus on South Brandon, which is what the presenter laid out. Um, but through further discussions, uh, the presenter desired to have us uh, kind of stick to the original scheme, which was to do this larger centralized pond and contemplate oversizing. And the trade-off there is we're dealing with very high level math here and not detailed design because the presenter's correct as, as the city's not looking to construct this pond for could be 15 to 20 years in the future. So for us to do detailed design of a pond right now doesn't make sense. But at some point in time, the city will need to pay for this pond. So we do need to con to ask for some level of contributions. The piece that's being challenged, though, is the, the number uh, because it is such a high level. And we acknowledge that uh, in engineering land, I think it's called a Class D estimate. And that's why we tacked on a 30% contingency, just because all the uncertainty. So when you're looking at the map here, um, the land uh, that's around their neighborhood plan, including this commercial, is all part of this area that goes to this pipe here. We acknowledge the pipe is quite a large pipe. In fact, would be one of the largest drainage pipes in the city of Brandon based on that catchment area. Um, but saying that, uh, although we've sat down with the developer and talked about this recommendation, we haven't had much time to talk about have back and forth about alternatives so that's something that i guess we could do as a follow-up understanding that uh, even with alternatives i'm hesitant to say that we're going to come to a form of a 
agreement, but at least we could hopefully come to a better understanding for council. So maybe there's a, a better sense of where the decision needs to be made. This is just a zoomed in uh, plan showing the different phases. So these first four phases of the mobile home park uh, were part of uh, the previous approval and the current uh, development uh, phase is for this area here further to the west. So that's the row housing. Um, as presented uh, by the developer at the start, there was a, a few items that they flagged. And as always, of course, council has uh, the ability to entertain um, different options at this stage um, associated with the different processes. Uh, Councillor Fawcett did bring up the discussion. Well, council could just give it second reading and then defer the discussion around the conditions to the next meeting. Um, and that's one approach. The only downside to that would be in accordance with the Planning Act, once you give second reading, there's a 14 day period that allows a developer to provide a second objection, which would trigger a second hearing. And that would be hard for the developer to determine if they were gonna provide a second objection because they don't have clarity on the conditions that council's applying. So it would be my recommendation to take one of two approaches. Either city council proceeds with providing second reading and then moving forward with the agreement conditions. Um, therefore, the developer could just um, provide a second objection, which would trigger a, a second formal public hearing where we could have this discussion in further detail. Or the alternative approach is just don't give second reading and defer it until the next council meeting altogether where administration could come back with a supplementary report providing council with a little more guidance on the decision at hand now, we, now that we understand the developer's concerns a little better. So with that, I'm gonna kind of throw it back to council and kind of see where council's leaning on their approach and I can certainly advise on some of the different alternatives I know Mr. McMillan had proposed some different alternatives associated with the planting of trees and swales, and we can help council through that. I just don't want to start doing that if it's the will of council to defer the request till the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nickel. I, I think we could use the opportunity that even if uh, council did have an appetite to defer, and it would seem to me, again, I think everybody is interested in expediency, especially the developer. So um, it sounded as though like maybe your, your second alternative would be just deferring it. Uh, it would be only for the two weeks uh, till our May 17th meeting, giving uh, uh, administration, the developer to you know, continue to uh, uh, tweak the, the, uh, the program so that it's uh, uh, a little clearer, you know, with, with respect to, you know, we're sitting here talking about 2,400 millimeter pipes and um, uh, oversizing costs and the like and uh, you know it's difficult for council to uh, make that determination in the middle of a, of a council meeting but in addition to the notion of deferring uh, maybe council could provide some uh, additional feedback I guess to to uh, administration so that you know, could at least uh, narrow up the list like there was uh, you know kind of the the major issue about the contribution to oversizing uh, you know which is kind of the big one and then there was about three other more you know smaller modest issues uh, that sounded like you know whether or not they would need to immediately grasp the swales while the thing was under construction and that seemed just sort of problematic from a maintenance a standpoint and there was could be another approach to that uh, the tree planting two meters versus three meters and the um, contribution to uh, I guess or pardon me the, the need of a landscape plan uh, versus just outright uh, asking for 62 trees whereas there may not be actual room for that many so uh, if council did provide some feedback uh, uh, Mr. Nickel wouldn't that at least um, provide a little more assistance in terms of what council's appetite is to some of those other issues. It sounded like all the rest of them, like the, the list is fairly lengthy, but uh, sounded like the rest of them are copacetic with both 
party, so of that long list, we've really only got uh, four that are uh, in discussion. Does that make any sense? Uh, to your worship, uh, yeah, certainly, if that's the will of council to, like, sort through what you're comfortable with sorting through today, and maybe deferring, oversizing, that would work for administration. Thank you. Uh, so, before we put any motions on the floor, this will be a little bit unorthodox, but I, I will allow um, a, a little bit of discussion on the part of uh, council. Uh, the ward councillor, uh, councillor Fawcett, may have uh, some leading comments on this, so uh, I'll let you go ahead, Councillor Fawcett. Yeah, thank you, uh, through your worship. Uh, having listened to Ryan there now, uh, I would probably be leaning towards uh, deferring it and hopefully getting it back for two weeks. Um, uh, the items number four, five, the grass eating, the swale, the two to three meters, and the 62 trees and stuff, I think that our administration and and uh, and, and the developer can work that out without a problem. I think they do have a discussion on the contributions uh, and the process there. And uh, again, that's a that's a discussion between the the, the staff and, and the developer, really to a, a great extent, to see what they end up uh, bringing back. And we've given them the two weeks. My my impression at first when I first uh, went through this was that. Uh, with us holding it in abeyance, that they would continue that discussion and then bring it back. But uh, that I might have been wrong on that process, as Mr. Nickel pointed out, we should either defer it now at second reading, uh, and then they would have the time to do that discussion uh, versus doing second reading, holding it in abeyance, and then and then having it come back. It's a process piece. Um, uh, I, I saw it uh, as just getting the second reading done uh, and then they'd have that time, but if, if, if it is the what he's recommending there, as the one recommendation I'd probably go with, it would be uh, to uh, defer it, uh, let them have that discussion, and then, and then hopefully within two weeks they can get back to us. I, I imagine it could be quite a, uh, quite a discussion, full two weeks of discussion before it comes back, but uh, I would hope that that might be able to... to get us where we want to go for everyone. Thanks for that. And, and uh, like you said, I, I thought you were on to something when we had Mr. McMillan in front of us. I think, oh, yeah, we really are only going to give it a second reading anyway, so we could keep moving ahead. But now, thanks to uh, Mr. Nickel, he's pointed out the, the nuances of the of the process. And, you know, we could unwittingly have made it more complicated by causing them to uh, trigger another hearing and, and actually uh, slowing it down when, in fact, we were trying to do the opposite. So thanks for that. And I have Councillor DeJarlie. Thank you, through your worship. Very, very briefly, Ryan, if we we do decide to defer our table this, uh, we could bring second and third reading next in two weeks, or will it be like that's what could happen? We wouldn't have to hold second reading in advance next time, so it would just be second reading, third reading, and make and we haven't lost any time. Your Worship to Council DeJarlie, and certainly Heather can jump in if she's the expert on all things uh, process, but uh, from my side of things, that doesn't save you time, uh, because the way the rezoning works is uh, Council would give it second reading subject to the development agreement getting executed before third reading. So if Council chose to, uh, to defer this item, uh, the discussion at the next meeting would be a decision by council to direct administration to go do the development agreement subject to all of these conditions and that it would still have to come back uh, to third reading at a future meeting. So it's really truly just deferring where you're at right now. It doesn't move you along. And that's where the other option would be just to give it second reading at, and then say third, all, subject to all these different conditions. Uh, but then, once again, the developer would have the ability to go through and issue a second objection. So it's either, from my perspective, it's one or the other, and it looks like Heather wants to jump in, so we'll let her do that. And go ahead, Ms. Uh, Iwazek. If I may, Your Worship, I think the issue here is that typically we can't give it a third reading until the development agreement has been fully executed. And 
the administration doesn't have a clear uh, clear result of what council is comfortable with, including in. So even though they can have a conversation with the applicant in the next two weeks and hash out all the finite details, council hasn't given their blessing, so to speak, on those conditions. And so we would still have to hold third reading in abeyance until that was uh, approved by council and then the agreement actually executed. Yep, thanks, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Cullen? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, the one thing that I want to make sure doesn't get lost is uh, just the fact that uh, drainage is uh, kind of our number one concern as, as all councillors that uh, represent their ward right now. And you only get a chance to do the in-ground on this stuff once. And so uh, if there is some sort of a, a process that we can work our way through, I just want to make sure that uh, whether, uh, you know, when it comes to cost sharing or whatever, that the, uh, the actual necessity as far as sizing is, is there. And so, uh, again, you only get one kick at the can to put this thing on the ground now. We know what happens when you uh, kind of make compromises as far as uh, what needs to be in the ground. Uh, so, again, in, during that review, I'd still like to make sure that uh, uh, planning and uh, administration is, is, is making sure that uh, the, the necessities are taken care of on this project. Um, if, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if cost sharing is worked out or, or different proportions are worked out or different timing is worked out, that's one thing. But if uh, we need the pipe, we need the pipe. So, uh, again, uh, 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 you know, again, I'm not the I'm not the guy that uh, that uh, could make that calculation. Engineering's got to make that calculation. But if it's uh, it's required, then by all means, we have to stick to our guns and make sure that uh, that in the end that uh, that drainage is uh, adequate to do what it's supposed to do. Thanks very much. You know, you are you are correct. We want it to be right, and but not get. I uh, not as accustomed to working in in uh, in millimeters when it comes to pipes, but I I did uh, look it up, and it's 95 inches in diameter, which is pretty much eight feet. So um, that that is a that is a monstrous pipe by uh, by the looks of it. So you know, I could, I could see we want to make sure we're right. Um, I'm not sure if Councilor Fawcett, did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you again for your worship. So if I could just uh, confirm some things with uh, Ms. Wasik and Mr. Nickel. Uh, so along the lines of what I was originally thinking is if we do second reading, uh, then, then, then you do go into discussion uh, about getting this uh, uh, development agreement signed, but but it, like are, are we sort of saying it's signed exactly as it's written, or you know, just give me a little bit more there because I I kind of thought that that would work. If I may, Your Worship. Yes, please. So the way the conditions are laid out in the agenda for council right now is what. It, uh, administration is proposing and that would be the agreement that would be put forth to the applicant. I think what Mr. Nickel was in, uh, getting to is that if they're not happy with that uh, and there seems to be some concerns with the current conditions they would have if we give it sec if council gives it second reading then they can implement the appeal mechanism which would uh, create the, uh, another public hearing for, for council, which would extend this process even more because of course we'd have to send out notice. I mean, it's not like we would be able to have the public hearing at the May 17th meeting because we don't have enough time. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It puts us sort of between a rock and a hard place, uh, which is uh, not super comfortable always. No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Ryan. I don't know if you had any other comments as far as the actual development agreement. No, Heather. Just for just for.
for Councillor Fawcett. I mean, what administration needs is direction from Council on how to proceed. So that's what we're asking. And if Council's saying uh, you'd, you'd like some more time for administration to perhaps bring back a little bit more information, then deferral's the right course of action. If you just want to see this, this, this process proceed, well, then the recommendation would be to give it second reading, but also to provide direction to administration on the development agreement. But based on the discussion right now, it, it doesn't seem like perhaps council's at the point where they're ready to provide that direction. So maybe deferral is the right course of action. Yeah, again, three words, right? I think that's probably the better route because I, I don't like the idea of council giving engineering direction. You know, I'm pretty uncomfortable with that. Just to clarify for council, uh, the design will be the design. So that's a technical piece that is reviewed and and accepted by our engineering group. Um, so in this case, it would be ditching that would be designed based on the design standard to a pond that would be on city land. With the long-term solution, which could be 20 years from now, that a pipe would need to be constructed and to do that, the city's going to need money. So the discussion here is not about, you know, should we do good drainage design or not? We're committed, and I'm sure the developer is, to doing the proper drainage design. It's about who pays for the long-term solution. Yeah, I think the, you know, I do understand that. And uh, like, uh, up, up in that exact area up there, we've had a Clare Avenue reserve for going on 20 years probably um, that did have the developer initially put money into it, which of course won't go nearly far enough to do any of Clare Avenue now. <laughs> is that uh, sort of along those same lines? Is that is that what we're talking about? Yeah, through uh, the His Worship to Councillor Fawcett, uh, somewhat along the same lines. The contribution to Clare Avenue was for the, the roadway improvement, but not yeah. in relation to drainage. No, I know. Yeah, but where, and then Clare Avenue is, is considered development charge improvement. I know this is high, gets really technical. Some improvements are lumped in with the development charge with the developers paying for, which would be the city's responsibility to construct Clare Avenue. And then the component we're talking about now, which is the drainage piece, which is the discussion around oversizing, which means one landowner is storing their water and conveying their water to another landowner's property. It's, it's tricky because in this case, we're, we're the other landowner as well as the development authority. So, as I see it, uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is a complicated uh, development matter. I mean, the, the bylaw contains 17 clauses. Uh, some of them are rather technical. There's uh, several hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, costing in there. So, I mean, the, the choices really were that it would just be adopted precisely the way it is now, or we're expecting council to make amendments, you know, in the middle of a council meeting, which I don't think we're capable of doing, as Council Fawcett put it, we're not going to engineer this. And, uh, you know, of course, those do work when, when the, you know, developer, you know, agrees to the clauses and the administration have agreed to it, then council passes it. But, uh, uh, given the fact that the, you know, it's been worked on right up until the, you know, the last day here and, you know, we're not quite at the finish line. The, the developer isn't um, quite uh, in agreement with all of the plazas. They're in agreement with many of them and uh, some of them are close and, you know, one needs quite a bit more work. So I don't see a whole lot of um, other possibilities that one way or the other, this has got to be uh, held over to another time. I think it's risky to do the second reading. That kind of starts the clock and uh, doesn't really get us any further ahead. In fact, probably uh, puts us further behind because the only 
remedy to the developer if we've given it second reading is that they have to cover themselves by putting in the second objection and then the administration has to plan the hearing and give the suitable amount of advertising and notice. So that probably takes even further down the road and then eventually we still come back to having to give it the third reading at a subsequent meeting. So to me that one unfortunately is going to be the method that would potentially provide the most delay. The chance of the least delay is to defer it to next meeting, ask administration and the developer to continue working on this as they had been right up until the kind of final day and just keep ironing out the formula for us and we bring it back in two weeks and hopefully we can give it second reading and third reading can be provided at the subsequent meeting. Am I making any sense? Okay, Councillor Shaboy with your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. You are making sense. I think that would be appropriate if we would, I would just like to speak to deferring it. I know that the developer said that he didn't get enough time to review all the specifics in the agreement and Ryan explained also from planning that there was not enough discussion on options. So I think that my opinion would be to defer it and then come back with some recommendations or maybe a different development agreement with some changes in it after they've had that discussion. I think you're right. I don't mind saying that deferring it two weeks is still a tall order as Councillor Fawcett put it earlier that they're probably discussing for the full two weeks and it's probably not the discussing that will take some time. There's some engineering that needs to take place from both parties. Obviously the developer indicated they've not been able to vet the numbers or the engineering from their side either. So there's some work to be done there and it's probably a tall order to have all that done in two weeks. But I think we all want to try keeping our shoulder to the wheel so this keeps moving along. So needless to say if both parties end up saying sorry we couldn't get it done in two weeks, we need more time, then they would make that known to Council. I think our Director of Engineering, Mr. Allard, has something maybe to add. Mark? Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Basically in my opinion this comes down to the dollar value in which we would request the developer to pay. Certainly engineering has every intention of designing this and we have time to design this and design this properly. The question would be when we go to build it, has the developer made fair contribution towards the future infrastructure? And today with the minimal engineering that we've undertaken, it's a very high level conceptual estimate that we present. And obvious the risk to us is do we collect sufficient funds to offset the portion of drainage that would service the current developer? So it's not so much of an engineering question. I think the developer in his presentation identified that development should pay for development, which I think is a very strong principle that we should follow. So the question in my mind simply comes down to the value of the contribution that he should make. And at the end of the day, I'm confident that the engineering solution will be arrived at. Thank you very much. This probably ends up falling, Councillor Fawcett unwittingly, probably not unwittingly, he probably always knows exactly what he's doing, but 
he made reference to the Clare Avenue contribution that the developer had to contribute to that many years ago, and we've yet to do that road. And as Jeff pointed out, there's probably not enough money in there. There was probably a lot of money when it was put in there many years ago, and now as costs have moved along, there's not nearly enough money to do it. So the city ends up having to bear that risk. So it's going to be a matter of how much risk we're prepared to take. But it really also kind of comes down to inflation. The problem is that we collect those, such as the case of Clare, but we don't add anything to the inflation. Like it's kind of not necessarily the developer's fault that they paid for it 20 years ago, and we decide to build it 20 years hence at four times the value of what it was calculated out at the time. So that's kind of a different discussion. Okay, I think we don't want to kind of go in circles on this. So it feels like we need to at least give administration and the developer time to put their heads together on this just a little bit more, see if we can come up with something closer to what council can view as a recommendation, and then we can take it from there at the next meeting. Councilor Fawcett? You're muted. Sometimes that's just as well. Thank you through your worship there. Now, Mr. Wasik, if I was to ask for a deferral on this, is it just to make a motion to defer? That's correct. You can either defer to a specific meeting, next meeting, or to a future meeting if you feel that it's your call. Time is money, so to speak. Obviously, if we wanted to get this thing going right away, it's got to pay the bill. But I think with what we've heard and discussed, I think we need them to have a little more discussion. So I would like to make a motion to defer, and I'm comfortable with putting on two weeks next meeting, but I don't know if anybody else that's actually going to be doing the negotiating is comfortable with that. But if they can't, then I guess they get it to us when they can. But the expectation would be if they could try to get that back to us quick, that we could do the second and third reading. That's what we kind of hope for, but you don't think we could do that? Through your worship, to Councilor Fawcett, yes, we would be able to give it a third reading at the May 17th meeting. But if administration has a two-week period that they could work on coming up with the definitive clauses for the agreement that are acceptable by both sides, then Council would be able to give it a second reading and get that execution of the development agreement in the works. Well, I think that I'd like to defer it to the next meeting of Council and with the hope and expectations that the two groups can come to something that will be acceptable to Council to be able to. Thank you. So Councilor Fawcett is moving deferral of this matter to May 17th. Is there a seconder? Councilor Cullen? I will add, for what it's worth, Councilor Fawcett, that this motion will mean that the matter is deferred to May 17th, and if the developer and administration agree they're not quite ready, well, it'll come back to May 17th with a report saying we're not quite done, and then Council can defer it again. So that's kind of a worst-case scenario, or fallback position, I guess you could say, but at least we're doing our best to keep things moving. Discussion on the deferral motion is not debatable, other than to date, so we're going to have to call the question 
on the matter. We've discussed the whole matter at some length. So I'm going to put the question now to counsel in terms of the defer to May 17th. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much again to the developer and to our administration. We know these are large and complicated matters. They're also very important, as has been indicated by really all parties, that it needs to be done right. And, you know, we want to, you know, both sides, you know, really just want to make sure that this is right and then that we can move swiftly along after that. So thank you very much. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7296, which is to rezone property at 1528-1524 Princess Avenue and 211 16th Street from residential low density and commercial general zone to downtown mixed use zone. Could I get some counsel to Jarley? Go ahead, please. Through your worship, do I bring it into second reading and do we get Ryan to talk to this one or how do you want to proceed here? Yeah, we can go either way on this. Sometimes we have him. Yeah, in fact, if he's ready to make a presentation, I don't mind that we do that before the motion. Thanks for saying that. Go ahead, Mr. Nickel, if you're planning to give us a highlight on this. Yeah, thank you, your worship. Through to counsel, no PowerPoint this time. I think this one's a little bit more straightforward than the last item. As was already stated, it's a rezoning request to downtown mixed use. It's along the Princess Avenue corridor. So when the city council adopted the last downtown plan, it was adopted with the vision to intensify those corridors out to 1st Street and 18th Street. So this is a development taking advantage of that new vision to bring new units to that area of the downtown. What's unique about this request is that it's proposing for deck parking, meaning that the second floor of the unit would be over the parking area, which is a creative solution for the downtown to allow for more dwelling units to be constructed. At the public hearing, there was some community feedback received in relation to concerns about parking. It should be acknowledged that there is a parking shortage in the area, but that parking shortage is not unique to this block. It's unique to all areas in close proximity to the university, as well as when city council went through the process to adopt the downtown secondary plan, this aspect was evaluated and it was deemed that the tradeoff we were looking for here was to promote new units downtown, which was providing greater flexibility on density and parking. And that was a way of achieving more street vibrancy rather than having the full parking requirement of 1.5 per unit. So although parking was a concern, the tradeoff was to promote investment in vibrancy, which is what this development was proposing. I'm saying that it was just two objectors and from a planning act perspective, if council chose to give this second reading, the objectors would not have a chance to do a further objection because there wasn't enough objectors to this request at the original public hearing. A few other details to note would be the servicing for this property wouldn't come from Princess, it would come from 16th Street through a formerly closed laneway and there would be an agreement in place that would provide access for the existing unit to the west so they could continually use that as a driveway to their units at no cost to them. And the 14 units would meet all other bylaw requirements, including downtown urban design. I don't know if council's looked at the schedule, but I think it's quite a nice proposal that would add a significant amount of street appeal to that stretch of Princess. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nichols. We'll open up the floor for questions of him before we get into the motion. I have a quick question, well not a question, just a comment of the two objections. First off, I just want to say that a really well-crafted letter raising some of the concerns that were brought forward 
exceptional. Just my hat goes off to the individual who wrote that. And then that that same individual, though, after um, discussing the matter with the developer, uh, chose to withdraw their objection. That was my understanding, and that they were going to uh, write a new letter in in support of the development. Make sure that comes to Charlie. Other questions, of Mr. Nickel? Do we know if that in fact happened, Mr. Nickel? Yeah, uh, through your worship, uh, the council, uh, your your council today, Charlie, was correct. There was a original letter of concern written by one of the residents, and there was a follow up discussion had between them and the developer, um, where they further understood uh, the development and. The, the target market of what they were looking for, and they removed their objective objection. I think there was still a few other objections related to parking, but that was the one objection. Thank you. Other questions of Mr. Nickel? Not seeing any. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Uh, we can come back to you, Councillor DeShirley, for the uh, motion of secondary. Thank you, Through Your Worship. I move that bylaw number 7296 to rezone properties located at 1528 1534 Princess Avenue and 211-16th Street, uh, both, uh, sorry, lots 21 and 24, both inclusive, and lots 25, X the slide, I don't know what that means, you guys, 13 feet, block 49, plan 2 BLTO, from residential low density to commercial general zones to, to, to downtown mixed use. Uh, zone be read a second time. And uh, do we, well, that would be a separate motion. Thank you. Seconder, please. Cameron? Who would wish to speak? Uh, not, that, not this time. Other discussion? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> frog in my throat there, sorry. Not seeing any other. I think we're ready for the question then on uh, second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Now go ahead on the third reading being held in advance. Don't, don't Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Through your worship, that third reading of this bylaw be held in abeyance pending the owner of or successor entering into a development agreement with the City of Brandon subject to the following conditions, conditions one through six is laid out here, and that administration be authorized to prepare a development agreement containing all conditions and requirements to protect the city's interests in accordance with any procedures, policies, bylaws, or acts. Perfectly presented. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Cameron, um, any discussion? Only a third reading being held in advance. Really, not like the last matter. It kind of shows how we have to work uh, that they uh, do exercise that uh, development agreement. So uh, I think uh, are we ready for question? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Excited, please. Giving up notice, Your Worship. Giving of notice this evening. Not seeing any. Next item, please. A motion to adjourn would be in order, Your Worship. Moved by Councillor Barry, seconded by Councillor Chaboyer. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Very uh, robust uh, amount of items on the agenda. Thank you very much, everyone. and. Uh, we got our new city manager kind of uh, baptized into a meeting. So thank you very much, Mr. Bowles, and thanks to all administration for your help this evening. We'll see you all soon. Good evening, everyone.